thanks for thanks for having me here. Uh, and uh, uh, and if I don't answer a question you have, we should have. I mean, I'm sticking around for whatever afterwards. Uh, in addition to the Wikipedia page, I also have to do an IMDb page, which I do know who did that, which was my daughter when she was like 14, <laughs> and uh, she copied the Wikipedia page and then added. He has two children and <laughs> to get herself a plug in there. Okay, so uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about what we know and what we don't know. And as Jay said, I try to actually pay some attention to what we do and, wh and why. And my background really before I, I, I was a storms guy, I, my master's degree is actually, I'm a climate guy to start with. Uh, I did the first modeling, uh, first simulations of the last glacial maximum uh, back in the early 80s. Uh, as, as, as originally as a summer student project and then moved on to be doing it as a, uh, as a, for my master's degree and then did volcanic aerosol transport. It's very exciting stuff. Uh, why, why, uh, why was Tambora what it was and Krakatoa and some of those things. So I, I did that for my master. So I was a climate guy to start with and then moved into the severe storms world. So, I do this in large part because it combines my original academic things, and I kind of know things about, uh, about things in theory at least. So let's start. And the place we start, everybody recognize this? What is this? Oh, we have a winner. We have a winner. Yes, this is ragweed. OK. Uh, and the reason, of course, that we start with ragweed in this talk is because okay, one of the things you may not know about ragweed is that ragweed puts out pollen as a function of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Okay? Uh, right now, each ragweed plant out there makes, put, produces, individually produces about twice as much pollen as it did 50 years ago because of the increase in carbon dioxide. Okay? It has nothing to do with temperature. It's purely a how much carbon dioxide is in the air. Okay? Another, other plants that do this kind of thing, the loblolly pine, Rah, 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 which probably looks a lot like, biologically looks like, like red cedar, which about eight months out of the year of my life, I have red cedar pollen stuck inside my nose, and I'm not a very happy person. But those are very direct things. And one of the things we want to talk, we're going to talk a little bit as we go on is, that, is how we do what we, what's called attribution. How do we actually understand what caused something to happen? And, with, and ragweed is sort of the ultimate direct thing. Carbon dioxide goes up, ragweed will, will produce more pollen. Boom, that's easy. Things, other things that we try to look at when we compare to climate change, we have to have a more indirect relationship. Now, we understand uh, that as carbon dioxide goes up, the temperature of the, of the planet goes up. Things that are kind of directly related to global temperature, we would expect them to change in frequency. That's a pretty direct thing. We go further away from that, precipitation, we have some understanding about how precipitation will, will probably change, but that's not as direct. By the time we get down to my world, which is the tornado world, the, combina the, the links in the chain, there are many of them, and we don't understand all of the things that are happening with that. But always come back to thinking about ragweed. Okay. I, I still have, I have a couple of additional allergy tablets with me if anyone needs one by the time of the, of the, of the thing. So, so, so and, and as I said, we, we, we understand how the, the effect of carbon dioxide on the global temperature relatively well. This is uh, one of the surface temperature data sets. They all look, all the surface temperature data sets look kind of the same. Uh, this, is, this is compared to the, to the 20th century. So now we are roughly uh, two, a degree and a half on average. The, the black dots are five-year averages. The reds are individual months. Uh, we're a degree and a half warmer than we were on average in the 20th century. Uh, probably pre-industrial pre revolution, if we did that, that'd be more like two and a half to three degrees Fahrenheit warmer than the planet was. And like I said, all of the, temp all of the uh, surface temperature databases would show the same kind of picture. The, uh, the satellite estimates that are, or that are relatively reliable show the same kind of thing. And we understand how this works. We've known that, uh, we've known that you add carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, the global temperature goes up. That's been known for 120 years. And the estimates of how much it would go up haven't, on average over the planet, haven't changed since the 1890s. Uh, Arrhenius came up with that number. Uh, he got a Nobel Prize for doing pH later on in his life. Uh, but th one of the things he did was the effect of carbon dioxide on global temperature. And he, uh, he predicted how much it would go up if we doubled the carbon dioxide content in the atmosphere. He made one minor error. 
He underestimated the amount of time it would take to double carbon dioxide by a few thousand years, uh, in large part because the internal combustion engine was basically developed about the same time. He made his prediction, and he didn't dream how much uh, we would actually be putting into the atmosphere. So, uh, uh, so we, we, we like to know things like where do things happen now. This is a, an animation that my uh, now PhD student, Kenzie Krocek, uh, put together uh, of essentially the pattern of where tornadoes happen in the United States on a, on a, uh, throughout the year. It's one frame every, every, uh, every week. The details aren't that critical uh, as we go. I've now up into the, what, the, the middle of summer, the biggest threats in the northern United States. And as we come down to the fall, it'll, it'll, it'll suddenly appear down in the southeastern United States uh, and hang around in the, in, in the southeast for most of the late fall and winter. And as we come in then into the, uh, at the beginning of the year, a lot of run through one more time, at least part way through one more time. It grows in the, in the late winter and then moves dramatically west rather quickly. And then up through the plains, moves north, north, or threat, uh, moves north in the plains. And you, know, you guys get start getting stuff uh, mostly in, in, in middle of April and later on. And then it moves bodily northward. So we understand kind of why this works. And this is related to how the ingredients of the atmosphere. Uh, I work for NOAA, and therefore I need to put up <laughs> some kind of a disclaimer that says that, you know, nothing I say should be endorsed as being coming from NOAA or anybody else I've ever met in my entire life. Yes, yes, yes. This is, this is the disclaimer slide for which I am most famously known now that I have to, that I have to do things out there that, uh, uh, yeah. So. <laughs> well, you know. Yes, you did. <laughs> yeah, some of you will who have, uh, uh, you know, remember, you know, look out, there are llamas. Yes, so, yeah, so, yeah, so, but yeah, so nothing, don't, don't blame anybody else if you don't like something, and, and that's, that's just up to me. So, okay, so the big questions we want to know are, what do we know about severe thunderstorms? I've shown you a little bit already. I've shown you what the pattern of tornadoes around the country. Uh, are things changing in time and why? Uh, and will they change in time? Uh, and so we're going to look at severe thunderstorms. And, by an accident of history in the United States, we define severe thunderstorms as being a tornado, a wind of at least 50 knots, which is 58 miles an hour, or hail of at least one inch. Um, there's no, w w heavy rain isn't, isn't severe thunderstorm in the United States. We're the only country in the world that heavy rain doesn't count, but that's a political thing uh, that, that goes on that some of the, I know a couple of weather service people in here probably could, I don't know if they'd speak to it, but they, yeah, huh, we all laugh about it. Uh, but that's what we think of as a severe thunderstorm. We know things have happened to rain. Like, for instance, in, in the last 30 years, uh, Oklahoma City, if it rains in July, the probability of getting at least one inch of rain, the pro overall probability of rain hasn't changed. It's still about 20%. So one every, out of every five days we get rain in Oklahoma City. But the probability of getting one inch of rain, by the, given that we've had rain, has doubled since 30 years ago. Uh, and one inch of rain in Oklahoma City is where we start to see street flooding. So that's a noticeable, noticeable kind of thing. Uh, but we're not going to say much more about rain because that's not officially severe. So, okay, so let's talk about why severe thunderstorms happen. So, uh, and I, I, I borrow these figures from, uh, from Yvette Richardson at, at Penn State that I was at a meeting with on Monday, and I liked hers. Uh, and uh, uh, we, we want to think about a particular kind of storm called a supercell. Uh, and supercell thunderstorms are important in large part because almost all of them produce some kind of severe weather. And the most severe thunderstorm, the most severe aspects of severe thunderstorms all come from supercells. Uh, if there's hail greater than two inches in diameter, it almost certainly came from a supercell. Uh, the thing that characterizes a supercell is a rotating updraft. That's it, the whole storm as it's going up, the air going up is rotating. Uh, and so we can think of how we get a tornado out of a supercell as, as a three-stage process. We want to get some rotation aloft. We want to get rotation at low levels after that. And then we have to somehow intensify that process. Uh, and so the first thing is, is if the, as we, to get a thunderstorm, we need to have some energy available for the storm. And we'll talk a lot of, I'll talk a lot about energy as we go through this. So we, have to have, we want to have warm, moist air at low levels and cold, dry air above that. And if we can magically get that air to go up, to reach that level, it'll start to rise on its own like a hot air balloon. But to make that storm rotate, we need to have the winds change height in the environment. Uh, and so we want to have, you can imagine 
if the winds are stronger on the top of the microphone than on the bottom of the microphone, there's a tendency to rotate. And as that air comes into the, into the storm, it'll start to spin and go up around a vertical axis like this. You can think of it, same kind of thing you see with a, with a spiraling football. It's spinning around the direction in which it's moving. The, this, this'll get us rotating, this'll get us winds that, uh, this'll get us storms that rotate above the ground, but it won't actually get appreciable rotation at the ground, vertical rotation at the ground, just by this process. So to make that happen, we need to have, whoops, let's have this, uh, do, do, do. okay, so, so with these two things will tell us, will you get a storm that'll rotate, the amount of the energy above the ground, sometimes we will refer to it as cape, there are other ways to look at it, and we'll frequently look at something, a quantity, the, the shear over six kilometers, so the change of the wind between the surface and say 20,000 feet above the ground. If that's large, and if the, if the energy's large, We'll, uh, we'll be able to get storms that rotate, and those things vary around the country, but they explain almost all of what we know about the distribution of severe thunderstorms. Ooh, it's dark. Okay, uh, and, the, uh, uh, and so those are, our, those are what we'll look at. I'll, I'll show some things where we have different ways, but always think of energy and wind shear. Those are the two big components that we're gonna be paying attention to. To get stuff down to the ground, we have to have another cool process happen in which we actually have uh, rain fall, and as that rain, as that rain falls, it, it tends to uh, produce rotation as, it, as the air falls quicker, and then we, through some processes which we won't call magic, but it's close to it for the, uh, we can actually get that rotation to get, get, to get kicked up. This was something I did with Bob Davies Jones back in the early 1990s, uh, and it, it exists because of the fact there's temperature differences. Within the, with it as, the rain, as the rain falls and cools things. That'll get some rotation down near the ground, underneath the updraft, but we don't necessarily have a tornado. But the places we put those ingredients together the most often over the central United States. You live in a place that is, a, that is the, almost the perfect laboratory for making severe thunderstorms like supercells. And the reason is, is that if you can imagine bringing in air from off of the, off of the south at low levels, there's warm, moist air. The Gulf of Mexico is a wonderful source of warm, moist air. The best way to get cold, dry air aloft is to bring it from over top of a high, wide range of mountains. And when we bring those two together, we're bringing in, the, in that way, we're bringing the right, um, the right combination of the, of the moisture and the air aloft, so we bring in the right temperature profile, but we're also having the winds change with height, the way we want to have them. So this is the, the easiest way to make storms rotate and this is the best place on the planet for it. Every other place on the planet has something a little bit wrong with it. Uh, you go in down into South America, and its moisture source is the Amazon. That's not as good of a moisture source as the, as the Gulf. You've got the Andes, they aren't as wide as the Rockies. The Himalayas are aligned east-west. That just doesn't work quite as well. Uh, the Alps are east-west, and the Mediterranean's not that big. So that when you, br and if you bring, if you think about it, if you bring air out of the south over the, off, over the Mediterranean, just before it got to the Mediterranean, it was over the Sahara. So it was really, really dry. And so if, it, if the winds aren't, if, and so to get it, that air moist, moistened over the Mediterranean, it has to be moving very slowly. If it's moving very slowly, then the red arrow is a little bird fart thing down here and nobody cares. And so it doesn't do very much. And so, the central part of the United States is the perfect laboratory to make supercells. Consider yourselves lucky. You get to have you know, tornadoes and softball-sized hail that the rest of the planet doesn't get to enjoy as often. And I get a paycheck, yay! Okay, so, uh, and we can actually now start to calculate by looking at where, we, we can actually calculate environmental parameters and see where storms happen in. And this is a real simple thing that uh, a master student of mine did years ago, where if you look at, this is now a horizontal scale that has energy on it, shear over here, and we've identified different kinds of uh, storms, red ones are tornadoes, blues are big but not tornadic, so this is your baseball and larger hail, uh, and greens are, you know, severe that's annoying but not necessarily really, really bad. And what you see is if we put all, that all the severe storms all the really severe storms tend to be up here where there's lots of cape, lots of energy, and lots of shear. Uh, and tornadoes, you'll notice, really, really, really like having, having shear. There are virtually no tornadoes below right here. There's this one little thing down here. So 
Severe storms like lots of energy and lots of shear. Uh, and so we're going to focus eventually on how those, how those change as we go in into, into the future. But it might be an idea that you might think that reports of severe weather might be a good place to start to, to this discussion about what's changed. The United States, our severe weather database is a target of opportunity database. Uh, we have to have a person observe the thing, and they have to know enough to get it to the right person for them to put it into the database. If you see the, if the tornado comes through the, your backyard and somehow no one notices it, and you don't tell anybody, it's not in our database. Uh, and that's true a lot. If you look at the map of hail reports in real detail, hail reports work like a highway map or a street map of the United States. Uh, virtually no hail apparently falls more than a short distance away from some roadway. <laughs> Storms are magic. Um, so, and there have been changes in what we, in how we, uh, and on what we report. Uh, in 2010, magically severe hail went from being three quarters of an inch to being one inch in diameter. So all that old stuff is no longer severe now, if it happened again. Uh, but there are some places where we actually report hail in the United States, in, in, on the planet. China has a whole bunch of human beings that, uh, that report hail on a daily basis. Yes, noted hail occur. And there are hail pads around, in, around, the, around the world where there's these little boxes with styrofoam pads on them that you go out and you'll have hailstones hit it and they leave a mark and you can actually measure how large the hailstone that hit it was. Uh, most of them are associated with uh, uh, that have done, had analysis done, are associated with wine growing regions in, in Europe because hail and grapes do not work very well together. Uh, and so the, the, they do that. So uh, this is hail observations from, from China. This is any hail. So forget the size on this one. This is does hail occur. And we noticed that uh, starting in the 1990s, we've slowly had a decrease in the number of hail reports in China, a lot. Hail doesn't occur as frequently in China as it used to. Um, in Italy and France, uh, the, uh, the top part is now, does hail occur? And the bottom, and over here on the right side from the, this is the French data, this is Italian data. Uh, this is a, what's called kinetic energy. This is a measure of how big the hailstones that fell were. And it's tending to skew towards larger hailstones. So we've had a, perhaps a small decrease in hail occurrence in France, but in both France and Germany, or France and Italy on average, an increase in the, in the size of hail that's falling. Or, are a skewness, a skewing towards larger hailstones that, that fall down. Um, but okay, uh, in the United States, we don't have that. We're going to return to that in just a minute as we try to explain everything in one time. In the United States, we have hail reports, and we report them on the Fujita or the enhanced Fujita scale that indicates what the peak damage was. This is the number of F0 tornadoes per year. It's gone up. Uh, I actually reviewed a paper in which someone said the small increase in F0 tornado reports over the years, and I was going, oh, 200 to 800. You have standards that I don't actually <laughs> understand. If we look at F1 and greater tornadoes, and these are the kinds of things that you will actually start to notice unless you live in a mobile home. You'll start to notice that they might do, you know, take some shingles off your house and things like that. Uh, that's stayed over the years relatively constant. It's about, it averages about 500. There's a very, very slight, not significant trend. But we got some periods that are, that are really small, the late 80s, uh, post-2011, it's been pretty small. Uh, big years, 1973, uh, 2011 are big years. So the average is about 500 consistently from the F1 and greater tornadoes over the years, but a lot of vi interannual variability, all kinds of jumping around and bouncing around. Uh, and so we're going to end up spending a lot of time talking about F1 and greater tornadoes because that's kind of consistent over the years. Um, so summarizing the reports, lots of reporting changes makes it really hard to use the reports. Uh, the hail, I didn't show you the United States hail. Instead of going up like the, the, uh, the tornadoes have gone up by from 200 to 800, they've gone up more like 200 to 20,000 reports for non-severe storms or for non-tornadic storms. And so they're almost impossible to figure out what to do with. Uh, lots of interannual variability. There's this small decrease in the mean hail size that we've seen from some things uh, out, of that, out of that data, but this increase in kinetic energy. And what appears to be happening is actually you start off with slightly larger hailstones than we used to have because things are a little bit warmer. Uh, but that they melt more because they've got a, because the, the, where the atmosphere freezes go, is up a little bit higher, so they have more time to melt. So the small, smallest hailstones melt away leaving only the somewhat larger hailstones. Uh, and so the distribution gets shifted, and there's a, but there's a real question whether this extends to, 
any of the sizes we care about. Like I said, that, the Chinese and the, the Italians and the French, almost all of that hail is below what we would call severe in the United States. And what happens, once you get to about two inches size hail, it only loses, as it falls from the cloud, it, it'll only melt and lose maybe 5% of its size. So that isn't a big change. So we don't notice that very much. If you get up, by the time you get up to say baseball size hail, hail that will hurt, uh, that melts so little that we don't really, that only melts a couple of percent. And so that hail size stays on. Okay, if, if you leave with no other information, baseball size hail falls, at the terminal velocity of a baseball sized hailstone, so we're how fast it falls, is approximately 100 miles an hour. So, for those of you who, like me, feel you were unfairly cheated out of your opportunity at Major League Baseball, go outside the next time there are baseball sized hail falling, and you can practice on fastballs. A helmet, perhaps, may be useful. Uh, other body parts that you care about, may, you may want protection for them as well. But a baseball sized hailstone falls at 100 miles an hour. That, that's a fun fact. Um, that's why it dents when it hits things, okay? <laughs> okay, so, uh, so what might have changed with tornadoes? Because tornadoes we're gonna we want to focus on because they're the most fun things around. Uh, and, oh, in case, okay, I, I get paid to do severe weather and tornadoes. If I say, the, don't take, if I say the word good <laughs> as a directional thing with tornadoes, that may mean more tornadoes, okay? Bad means fewer tornadoes, okay? Just in case I say that and you wanna, you can translate into your own value system if you care. So we wanna look at some things like what's the impact of seasonal temperature on, on things? And to do this, we can do something really simple. We can look at old historical records of temperature. Uh, and we can look at see how, what EF1 and greater tornadoes, how they have, have looked at out of our database. And what we find is the ba gray background is the, is the number, at least the three month average, so in, in April, Mar May, and June, we tend to average about 270 total over, the, over those three months, so that'd be 90 a month with, uh, uh, F1 in, with F1 and greater tornadoes. But the changes as we go between, as we change the temperature in the United States, winter time, we have more t tornadoes go up uh, for each degree Celsius, so you know, almost two degrees Fahrenheit. In the winter time, we may, be, we may go up about 10 to 15 tornadoes a month, but warm summers are associated with a lot fewer tornadoes, a lot fewer tornadoes. Uh, when we start looking at, uh, at, the, at the May, June, July time period, we lose essentially uh, uh, about 20, about 15% about, uh, uh, of the tornadoes for every degree Celsius we are above normal. Okay. Hot summers, no tornadoes. Hot winters, more tornadoes. One of the really interesting things about this, if you'll think back to the, that graphic of where tornadoes occur, adding tornadoes in the winter time tends to have them occur in the southeastern United States. Okay. People live in the southeastern United States. Taking away tornadoes in the summertime, that's mostly in the northern plains. If you get out away from Bismarck and Fargo, no one lives in North Dakota. Okay. Oh. Where are you from? See, I said, well, you, see, you're in Fargo. So someone lives in Fargo. So that's okay. That's okay. Yeah. Good. And, well, yeah, Willis, yeah, Willis and I was going to have to make up another story. Yeah. Uh, but okay. So, but, and roughly what it is is that for every square mile in rural Alabama, 25 people live in it every square mile on average. You go out into, say, 50 miles away from Goodland, I'll mention them, I'll stay away from North Dakota, yeah. Uh, 50 miles away from Goodland, that population density is about one person per square mile on average. So the, this is one of the things that we know in terms of impacts of tornadoes, as you put a tornado into rural Alabama, there is a person in the way. You can put really long track tornadoes through the plains and there's no, there are no people. You know, there may be some cows and some mesquite trees, but there's no people, uh, or very few people. That's one, of the, that's one of the big reasons that tornadoes in Alabama kill a lot more people than tornadoes in the plains. Okay. So this shift could have important impacts for how, we've, how things happen. 
A um, little bit of differences in the, in the locations. This is the, the 20 coldest years in the, in the, uh, uh, in the, in the last 60 years. Uh, and there's the, it's the composite made out of the 20 coldest months from each year. Uh, and then the 20 warmest, and you see a shift to the east as we go to, as we go to the warms. That's almost all in the, in the uh, uh, that's associated with some small things. We also see a little bit of a shift towards the north. It's maybe not the best way to show the graphic. but So we see some small changes in the location, but not, not all that big of, of changes in the location. If we look at the annual cycle, uh, these are now centered on, on three months, centered on different things. Cold years are the, in the blue. Only time we have tornadoes in cold years in the in cold years in the U.S. in the winter time is way far southeast. That shifts a little bit further northwest as we go in to where a cold March looks like a warm January for tornadoes in the United States. Okay. Uh, the springtime and the summer, eh, the locations don't change that much as we go from cold to warm years. There are fewer in the in the warms, but they're but they're about the same locations on average. So, uh, so what else might have changed? The timing of the season may have changed. Uh, one of my friends uh, in the climate biz uh, in March after some early, March of 2012 after some early, after some tornadoes or actually February uh, after some tornadoes in 2012 said as spring moves up a week or two tornado season will start in February instead of waiting for April. It's bothered me for a lot of ways. One is one of them is if it moves up two weeks, why does we why do we skip the whole month of March for the beginning of the season? I was born in March. I have a little bit of a feeling for you know, skipping my month made me mad. Uh, but the real question was, when does tornado season start? That's a silly answer, because we have to come up with an answer. So what we actually did to look at this question was, let's look at, there's 500 tornadoes a year in the United States, F1 and greater. When, what day is the 50th tornado of the year? It's 10% into the season. We can look at that. Uh, and this is what we find. This is the date of the 50th tornado each year, uh, all the way from 1954 up to 2017. Uh, and what we see is there are almost all of the late starts to the season have happened in the last 20 years, and most of the early starts to the season have happened in the last 20 years. The first 40 to 50 years of the record, almost every year, the 50th tornado happened between about the 3rd of March and the 15th of April. Since then, we've avoided that time period very well. We've had lots of early starts, lots of late starts. A lot of variability increase in the, in the, in the report, in the when the season has, quote, started. Uh, this is why we can skip March, I think, as, as it turns out. It actually is a, I hate to say it, but there actually is a reason. Uh, we've also seen some work done. This is long in story out of the University of Montana. He looked at, 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 attempted to measure in the plains, so Texas, Oklahoma, Texas up through Nebraska, when is the, uh, uh, when's the middle of this, when's the peak threat of the season? Uh, the first 10 years of our decent record, which starts in about 1954, the middle of the season was about May the 25th, moved forward to May the 19th, and then on May the 14th has gone on. So the middle of the season has moved forward in the plains by about 11 days over the past, over the past 60 years. Seasons moved a little bit earlier in the plains. That variability is uh, tied more to the southeastern United States. The, that 50th tornado, that's all southeastern U.S. stuff. We don't get very many tornadoes in the plains that, that early in the year. So we see an increase in variability in the southeast, and it appears to be a little bit of an earlier shift in the, uh, in the, uh, in the plains. Uh, and we can actually measure that in the plains now. Uh, colleagues at, the, at Columbia University uh, have, have come up with a proxy model that tells us a lot about the, uh, the long-term occurrence, which is a combination of the, of the, of the energy and the, and the, uh, and the shear terms. And the, the middle of the season, let's just look at the top figure, the middle of the season is the, is the blue, and the red is their environmental proxy. And both of them have moved forward by about the same amount. So it appears that it's the, it's a, the environmental parameters, it's not just that the reports have moved earlier, it's the environments which know nothing about the reports have moved forward. So it's, it's not a reporting issue, it's, a, it's physically occurred that the season has moved, has moved somewhat earlier. Uh, so we've seen this in periods of increased variability, the starting date. Uh, almost all of our monthly records, these are, the mo these are when the most and fewest tornado, F1 and greater tornadoes have occurred on record. All of the records are in the last half of the data, of the, of the data series. It's hard to explain this as a reporting issue, that we've, 
because this is, if, it, if we were reporting better or worse or something like that, we'd expect to see the one of the rec set of records be at the beginning of the season at the record and the other one be at the end of this period. Instead, they're all at the end. So we're seeing increased variability occurring. Uh, and there are more tornadoes on the, uh, or the cha number, change in the number of tornadoes per day. Uh, this is, the blue is the number of days per year with at least one F1 or greater tornado. It was about 150 of them in the 1970s. This is anywhere in the United States. It's now down to fewer than 100. We've lost a third of the days in which an F1 greater tornado occurs in the United States in the last, 50, in the last 40 years. But the number of days with at least 25 have gone up from being, oh, one a year on average. The red dots are, are seven-year averages, up to four per year. And this is occurring even in years that are relatively quiet years. We still get big days. So we're having fewer days, but more tornadoes on the, on the days when they occur. Uh, and if, when you put it together, we end up with this average of 500 staying true the whole time through. Uh, and, the, uh, and again, we go back to that environmental proxy uh, that looks at things. Cape on the, on, the, on the left side hasn't changed much over the years. These are sort of the smallest values of Cape and the bigger and bigger values of Cape. But the, sh uh, the quantity related to the shear term has it gone up? Ex has gone up a lot for the highest end of it uh, over the years, and that seems to be driving that change in variability. Has been this increase in the in the shear term that's going on. The really interesting thing for attribution studies is when we think about what's going to happen as the planet warms, we expect this to go up and this to go down. So this is not a direct yes. No, I can't probably yeah. CAPE is, is energy. That's, that's convective available potential energy is what it stands for. So that's essentially the energy available for the storm that makes the air go up. And this is a, a quantity that's related to that shear term that says, do we get rotation out of the storm? Okay? So, yeah. So this is a source of things go up, things spin on the right side. So why did this happen? I will give you one answer that if, in case I forget it, it later. We don't necessarily understand the causation for what this is. It's uh, the guy who made this figure, Mike Tippett from Columbia, and I have a friendly disagreement over, over what's gone on. Uh, he thinks this could be related to some long pattern change. I'm pretty sure this is somehow related to the planet warming up. We just don't understand how. That perhaps the, as, the, as we've melted ice, the pattern of waves in the atmosphere has changed, and that could have an impact on it. But we don't understand it. We really don't have, this is where there are like three or four links in the chain that are broken that we don't understand and we haven't gotten fixed yet. So we don't fully understand this. This isn't like ragweed. Okay. We know it's physically we don't understand it. No, this is, this is, this is a, uh, we need someone really smart to come up with a good answer. Uh, and we don't understand how the patterns have changed. That's the other part of it. And how, if the patterns have changed, do they actually change tornado ingredients in the way that we care about? That's. There's like three different parts of it that are wrong. The data are there. We just, we're not smart enough. You know. Well, no, let me rephrase that. They are not smart enough because I haven't tried to do it yet. And I won't, so that's okay. I can always get away with it. Uh, so what we've seen is there's increased variability. There's some temperature impacts. Tornadoes like, the, like warm winters and, the, and they like cold, they don't like cold, they don't like uh, uh, warm summers. Uh, and there's maybe been a change in location. But one of the things we can do is we can model where we think so, thinks things are simply by taking one of these kinds of plots and just say, well, if you're up above this line, we're going to call it a yes, it's severe. Uh, and below it, it's going to be called it a not, and that'll be pretty close to being good. And we can actually redraw that, rescale it to where things we, we emphasize things in the upper right a little bit better. This is the same plot with different axes and skewed a little bit. Uh, this is where the atmosphere, this is the, the gray is the distribution of where environmental conditions actually occur. Most of the time, the atmosphere is in low energy, this is an energy term across the axis still, and low uh, uh, shear values. And the red lines are probability of severe thunderstorms occurring. Severe thunderstorms like to live out in this area that doesn't happen very often. The planet would be un uninhabitable if severe storms happened where the environments are frequently occur. So this is, this is we're kind of happy with this. Uh, but the, incre the probability increases with having, of, of having storms as we go up to the right. And we can do some simple things to model what storms should look like around the world. Uh, this is what the United States says if we do a simple cutoff of where severe storms ought to be in the, uh, uh, based on above that, above that line. Uh, a lot of them in the middle of the US. 
Uh, and we can then go around and see what that should look like around the planet. And you see, you know, we're up here. South America's down there. Uh, if you don't know that, we need to talk a little bit more. Uh, and this has been, uh, this can actually been uh, associated then with some work from satellite data that looks at just what a satellite thinks uh, the strongest storms look like. And, you know, if your eyes aren't that good, if you take your glasses off, those are the same map. A yeah. <laughs> little fuzzy, but, you know, it's about the same kind of thing. So this looks to be a relatively good, a robust thing that we can go forward with, and we can make maps of where we would expect to see tornadoes occur. We used a couple of other parameters, uh, and it turns out most of the places we'd expect to see tornadoes, the central part of the U.S. really is dominant, and down into, into South America. This has actually shifted off of their primary severe location that southern Brazil actually leads the way down there and a few other places that have threats, southern, southeast China. There's a low grade threat all the way across northern Europe, eastern Australia and the southeastern uh, South Africa. Oh. So, but these is, we can make these things, these, these are purely environments, not driven by any of, the, any of the reports, and we can make some estimates and we can see how things will change as a result of what's going on. Uh, and so I want to look at the individual threats, tornado, hail, and, and wind, and see how they change. Uh, look at the pattern, don't look at the numbers and the details. Uh, and what we see very simply is, as the, okay, energy again goes from right to left, shear goes from up, from uh, low to high. Hail likes lots of shear. Wind likes low shear, so non-tornadic wind storms tend to occur in lower wind shear environments. Tornadoes, and you don't need, I don't want you to read the numbers off of these graphs because they won't mean anything to you. Uh, they don't mean anything to me either, but that, uh, the spacing of the lines indicate how strongly, how quickly it changes. Tornadoes really, 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 really depend on having changes in the wind with height in the atmosphere. That's, a big, that's the big thing about tornadoes, and that's why we, we tend to get so many of them here. So you can think of this as being hail likes, hail and tornadoes like shear, wind doesn't like shear. Okay? Um, so, uh, and so we see that the, uh, the tornadoes are really sensitive to it, and, that, and the intensity of tornadoes also is with it. So what's going to happen in the future? I kind of talked about this a little bit. Cape's going to go up. All the, we've seen that actually. There's actually a slow increase in the average Cape going up. Uh, that's related to the moisture at low levels, which is related to uh, temperature in the atmosphere. The shear is going to go down because that's related to the equator to pole temperature gradient. The poles warm more than the equator. The wind shear in the atmosphere should be going down. Uh, but we really care about the combinations. Because if that could happen and we could have lots of good things happening, lots of tornadic conditions happening, because uh, they because they happen to go, the shear happens to still be up when the cape is up. Uh, and so but to do that, we actually get a couple of things, climate model simulations and what we call dynamically downscaled models, where we take climate models and we drive small models and we can look at what's going on with them. So, okay, we go back to this. What we expect to have happen in the future is the atmosphere will shift more down towards this way. I should probably have that arrow down here. It'll shift more down into this range. And what we really, we're really interested in what happens, how does this change related to those, those red contours in the background? Uh, and the first person to really look at this in a good way on a regional basis in the U.S. was Jeff Trapp, now at the University of Illinois. Uh, and he divided the U.S. Into these, into these five regions and looked at a long climate simulation that ran from 1950 to 2100. The updraft term, so the, the cape is on the left, the shear term's in the middle, uh, updraft, all regions, it goes up on average. Uh, shear, eh, kind of, if you actually look at the mean, it goes down some. The southern Great Plains is the, where it goes down the most. Uh, maybe it's kind of northeast. It may kind of wander around, and it goes up a little bit. When we put the combinations together, so we actually now care about both of them going together, the Cape wins because the, the frequency of the good environments goes up in all the regions over the 150 years. However, notice, particularly in the southern Great Plains, how much variability there is. Uh, the third year from the end of the simulation, when things are, on average, are way up high, is actually like the fifth smallest year in the entire record. The, uh, this early year in the simulation uh, doesn't get passed for another 70 years. So the variability of, of, of environments is really, really huge. We will, even if, if storms go way up in the future, we'll still have really small years. You know, b bad years, years without very much happening. Uh, and we, just as we've had big years and small years in the past. Uh, so, uh, Noah Diffenbaugh at Stanford uh, did some things where he actually started to look at that in, in terms of spatial correlations. Where does it go up? Maybe it goes up in some parts of the country and not in others. And what he found was that these are now seasonal. Uh, red is in increases in events. 
uh, and uh, blue is decreases. Cape goes up over virtually the entire country in virtually all seasons. The only spot where it goes down on average is down here in the, in the southwest in the spring. Every place else, Cape goes up. Shear, the shear term, goes down almost everywhere in all seasons, except the southern part of the US. Uh, it goes up a very little bit in the summertime. Uh, but it's, and, and the stipples are where it's, the, the confidence is high, and the not stippled, the confidence, because of differences in the different models, isn't, isn't nearly so high. Uh, there's this other little interesting spot out here where the shear goes up out, whatever those two states are out there on the boundary between them. Uh, so, yeah. so that's where th patterns go. We put them together, and what we find is, this is now putting the combinations together. Most of the country, the frequency of severe storms environments goes up in all over the country. The models, these are different model simulations. They all agree in the springtime, everything goes up. They agree in the wintertime, things go up. Uh, or in the, in, the fall, in the fall, everything goes up. The winter, eh, we're not quite so sure. One of the models gets really excited. There's a lot of disagreement in the summer. And the place where, on average, things are supposed to go down is over the plains, the central plains. The reason why it goes down, and there's a lot of disagreement, this is why we see some, some models say down, some models go up, some models say no change. Uh, this is actually not a good thing. The environments go down because those are the model simulations that think there's drought all the time. If there are no storms, you get no severe storms. Uh, and about a quarter of the simulations think that essentially uh, what's currently summer wheat will be in drought most of the time. So Goodland, Kansas, one of my favorite places. Is there anybody from Goodland here? Anyone been to Goodland? OK. Congratulations. Uh, OK, one, Goodland's one of my favorite places to pick on for this talk. Uh, if you lived in Goodland in the future, apparently you have your choice of drought or softball size hail every year. It's going to be really hard to grow crops out in the, out in the plains to go along. So this is one of our great points of uncertainty is what happens around here in the summer growing season. If, and one of the really, the scary part about this is associated with this actually is the impact that that has as we move the, uh, this would indicate perhaps a move of the wheat corn growing line east. Um, this is what would be considered potentially really, really, really bad for the food supply if we can't, if we can't grow a lot of corn in Iowa and those kinds of places. Uh, we have long-term historical records of where, the, of where the wheat, the equivalent of the wheat corn line is because of pollen records from old trees. And we can tell that, that back uh, the last time that the planet was, was close to as warm it is, is now 8,000 years ago, the wheat corn line was essentially east on the eastern end of Iowa. So Iowa would not be growing any, any corn. That's a little, that was the last time the sand hills were actually really sand. <laughs> yeah. That gets really complicated. Um, the, 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 the spring looks like it's wet. The early part of the spring looks like it's wet. The late part and into the summer looks like it gets dry. And so that's a, uh, that, you know, I don't know what happens then. You know, and, and I, don't, I, don't know if, I don't know if you can shift the season early enough that you can actually still grow stuff or not. No, yeah, yeah, no, but I'm just, yeah. That's right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Well. Okay. Okay. The graphs are better for thinking of them as severe. Okay. Um, tornado. The problem with tornado in, in some of the climate model simulations is the thing that they're weakest at is that is the are some of the details that tell us it's tornadic versus non-tornadic. So the uh, the low level wind shear and the low and the profile of the boundary layer moisture turns out to be important for tornado, severe doesn't care. So you might want to think about these as being more, telling us a lot more, in, in some sense, about what the hail, hail is going to be like. Anyway, I mean, tornadoes are only 10% of the, of the severe anyway. So that's part of the signal here. You could have changes in the tornado. We'll talk about this in just a minute. Well, you'd have changes in the tornado that are completely masked inside of this. That's where we're, we're less confident. I'm least confident what's going to happen with tornadoes. I'm most confident what's going to happen with wind and hail. Okay, so, uh, and that's what we actually been done. Uh, Victor Gensini, who was my summer student years ago when he got started, 
essentially took those climate model simulations and ran a four kilometer resolution uh, weather model in it that we use for weather forecasting now. And just said, hey, let's, let's, let's see what the model, the, that, the question about what kind of storm will it be, uh, will a storm get started? We'll let, the, we'll let that weather model answer that question. Uh, what well, also means we, get, we look at the environments and the storms, and he ran it for three months uh, in 11 years in the late 20th and late 21st century. This is an incredibly expensive computational problem to do, so he couldn't do a whole lot, but so this is what we've done to start with. Um, and this is where his environments are. This is now his energy term on the top, uh, and this is how, how it changes. Lots more energy available uh, in the southern part of the U.S., in particular in the springtime uh, as we go into the 21st century. The environments, you can see how the, the number of favorable environments goes way up. And you notice how it's way, it, it goes up over uh, you know, all of the southern, south central part of the U.S. Uh, and it goes up more than the energy goes up. So this is, a, this is look, it appears to be a combination of shear going up. Um, but then when they actually, and, and if he actually then runs the model, he can see where the storms increase and decrease. And the biggest increase in, this, in the storms uh, actually occurs a little east of where we see the favorable environments. That the, what, the, what that's telling us is that in this region, even though we've had a big increase in the number of environments, the storms actually don't get started. And the question of whether, lots of times if you're, as forecasters know, Lots of times, the, que the big question is, will you get a storm at all today? If we get a storm, it's going to be a supercell, probably tornadic, big time problems. But the difference between storm and no storm is really small. Uh, and that it's either, you're going to have supercells with tornadoes or blue skies. And this is essentially saying, blue skies, we, we get a, a larger fraction of blue sky events. You can also look, though, with this at, uh, Let's, let's accumulate the season. Let's see what the season looks like. Uh, and so this is now for each one of the 11 years, and they don't actually correspond to real years, so don't, don't worry about that. The black line is the average from his 20th century runs, and the thin black lines are the individual years. The red is the same thing for the late 21st century. And what we see is, on average, an increase in the number of, in, of severe storm environments, favor, or severe storm occurrences in the model simulations of about 20% on average from the late 20th century to the late 21st century. But notice how much bigger the variability in the late 21st century is. The highest four years of all the record occur in the late 21st century, but also the two smallest years. Large increase in variability of storm occurrence with a small increase in the mean. This is consistent with what we've seen in the tornado reports and some other proxies for the, for the severe weather environments in the, in the, uh, in the past. So, uh, okay, so the environments, we, we've seen the, the energy term increases, the shear decreases, more environments are favorable. There's a big tendency for non-tornadic, I think our strongest evidence is for non-tornadic wind events. I didn't show it, but that's true. Weaker evidence that we've seen this long-term increase in tornadoes and increase in variability, but it's a, the evidence is weak, and I'm, it'll take us a long time to get out of the noise to tell that, to see if there's been a change. But a lot of that has to do with how big the variability already is. Uh, and the big question is, what do we get storms to start, is a, is a big one. And do the patterns change in a way that we don't really understand very well yet. So, okay. Uh, Jay wanted me to talk a little bit about how the media covers climate. So, I'm, I'm going to do that. Uh, and we get some really, one, I, do a lot, I do a lot of interaction with the media. Uh, we see some wonderful... Uh, Wonderful things. Uh, tornadoes are now ganging up in the ice. And this is from Smithsonian, Smithsonian Mag. So this is not a wacko. Uh, twist, twisters are not increasing in numbers, but they're clustering more often, a bizarre pattern that has meteorologists stumped. Uh, so I was officially stumped in this, uh, apparently in this, uh, in this article. Uh, and that's, I, I prefer the word stunned. Uh, <laughs> stu you know, I, I played a little bit of cricket in my life, and. You know, stumped is a really bad thing. Uh, so we, we actually do have uh, a, fa a famous journal that refers to top scientists being stunned. The lips are moving. Uh, say stunned scientists. And then, boy, but this kid's going to help us out when he gets older. Uh, uh, see, doctors are dazzled. Scientists are stunned. I, I, I'm, I'm offended. Uh, so, uh, but they do cover, you may not have noticed, Weekly World News does cover tornadoes uh, and, and have done so for years. Uh, uh, the, uh, yeah, uh, this is, this is tor a tornado that, that no one's ever heard of before that killed a whole bunch of people in Mexico uh, and had more than 350 mile an hour winds. Uh, 
Uh, and this poor woman, Dolores Rosillo, snapped the frightening picture. Whatever. If, if you read carefully here, here's the real good story, though. Two killed when flying carpet crashes into jet. Uh, um, uh, yeah, uh, the two va male victims were riding on the carpet. This is where the scientists were stunned, actually, was this one. This one we're okay with, this one is where we got stunned. Uh, this, these are both from, from you know, the 90s, both of the work of the world news things. Uh, one of the big things that's happened is that the, the, the media landscape is much broader than it was 20, 25 years ago. Uh, Joe, how long have you been? Uh, in TV, we'll do that. Oh, so you started when things were easy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. okay. Uh, you have to put lots of social media stuff out now, right? Uh, hey, and he's, smi he's smiling. He's smiling when he said that, yeah. Uh, or was that, were you, were you gritting your teeth when you said that? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. So, uh, and one of the things that's happened is that when I, when I got started interacting with the media, uh, there were a couple of things. We had this sort of the traditional short form versus long form story. Uh, when you would do things with, with uh, television, or, or radio, you know, lots of snippets. With one big exception, when NPR wanted to do a story, you give me an answer for two minutes, fine, we'll deal with it. Uh, Bill Blakemore, who used to be on ABC News, came and did a tornado story, and basically said, I'm gonna start the camera, you're gonna talk to me for two, three hours. You're gonna teach me everything you know about severe storms. You will hear my word, you will hear your words out of my mouth in the story, but you're gonna teach me, I'll occasionally ask you a question, but you just say what you wanna say and we'll, I'll, I'll make a story out of it. You get other ones that it's, you know you've got your five second answer coming up, and I know how to give an answer using words that will never be used in the media. I'm very good at polysyllabic answers when necessary. And they'll ask the question again, and I can make it even more obtuse. Uh, and they won't use that. And then if I, want, if I want to answer the question, I can answer the question and in a snippet that can be used. Uh, we also have times when we, when we talk to a science reporter. You know, uh, Seth Borenstein at, at AP. Seth's learned enough about climate and weather over the years. He's, he's actually pretty good. Uh, the Capital Weather Gang guys at, at Washington Post, they know what they're talking about. They, they can ask intelligent questions and understand nuance. Um, there are other times when you get that poor uh, person who you know, they covered the car wreck this morning. They're doing the weather and climate story this afternoon, and tomorrow they're doing the opening of the new grocery store and the you know, ribbon cutting kind of story. They, ac they actually don't want to learn very much during the course of their story because that's, they're ju it's just another thing they're doing, and they have to do X stories this week. And if they don't come up with a story and one gets assigned to them, that's their job is to, is to do that. Uh, one of the network news things, the, with network news, uh, when there's a big tornado outbreak, I talk to network news. I talk to most of the networks. I rec uh, it's scary. I know the CBS Evening News with whoever their thing is, which is how they always identify themselves. I know their phone numbers down to where if I see the right first six digits of the phone number, I know it's CBS Evening News calling me. And I can choose to answer that or wait. Uh, I know ABC News' phone number. That's really an awful thing, I think. Uh, but CB, well, one of those, I'm sorry, one, one of those networks, uh, they have an assistant producer who will do a lot of the legwork on the story. And they change that assistant producer from tornado outbreak to tornado outbreak. So you have to go through all of the stuff about what are the, what are the, what are the uncertainties in the database? How many, they always ask the question, how many tornadoes happened today? And I'll tell them, well, three months from the end of this month, we'll have the final numbers for you. And they tend not to like that as an answer. Uh, there was only one time when they had the same assistant producer stay on for more than three, three outbreaks in a row. And she actually finally learned, I could tell her exactly where in the, on the website I was looking. And she could do it herself. That was fun. Um, but other than that, they just want to know what the answer is. Uh, everybody wants to have a number that, that comes in. And so how they, how they actually understand these things is a real big, is a real big problem. But probably the biggest thing is advocacy sites uh, in, in all directions uh, who wish to color the response that they have based on whatever they, what they have a point that they want to make. And this is true 
both in terms of climates not doing anything interesting or the world will end within the next two weeks unless we immediately stop all carbon burning. Uh, it happens on both sides. I will say this. I can tell, I, I do, this is a sick habit I have, but every day I do a search for things that have been published in the last day that looks for tornado and global warming and tornado and climate change and see what's up there. And I find misstatements <laughs> frequently on, on the, what might be called the denier side of the world. If I comment upon the fact that you've misinterpreted the data, I receive a great deal of vitriol on, on the, what I would think of more as the mainstream science side, it's almost always, what did I screw up? Can you help me write it better? And I will, I will remove what I've got. And that's sort of become my litmus test of how there are certain advocacy sites that will do the, you're, you know, you're lying to me stuff. And I can kind of tell who's legit by the, when I go, you know, you can't do that with a database. Uh, and I think that's a big, that's a big thing. So, uh, and many groups want an answer, uh, and we don't always have answers. We are uncertain about a lot of stuff. Like I said, I understand ragweed and climate. Boom. I don't understand tornadoes and climate completely. I know more about it, I think, than anybody on the planet, but I don't understand everything that's going on. Uh, and that nuance is, a big, is, a, is something that's, that's difficult, and that's where we, we've lost, I think, a lot with the, the long-term relationship with reporters. Like when Seth Bornstein or Doyle Rice from USA Today get a hold of me. We've been doing this for a decade. <laughs> they know, you know, we can have honest conversations, and that's not always true on some of the things that are going on. Uh, there's also a desire in the media in lots of places to have a false balance. Uh, they want controversy, so therefore they have to have someone speaking one direction and someone speaking the other direction, even when in reality there's no real controversy. If you want to talk about is the temperature of the planet warming up, there's no real controversy in science about that. That is, and it's because of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We know that. That's, that's known. It's, you can't actually find anybody who seriously believes that's not true in, this, in the scientific community. But we have to have those kinds of voices heard in the, in the media reports. And that's not a good thing for in terms of our, in terms of our, our, of our education and our understanding of the, of the people. I believe that's it. And there may be a... Yep. Oh, no, I'll, I'll, we'll close that with a real summary. Uh, what we know and what we don't know, we know that there's been an increase in the favorable environments for severe. We've, we've seen this increase in variability. We don't understand why. And that's a real, that's a, hopefully I'll know more about that within two years, about why the variability has increased. We've got some questions about how the season, how the timing of the season changes, because that's, that's changed some things around. And that has impacts on where, on, on, on spatial changes in, in severe thunderstorm environments. We're not as good with that as we are on sort of the general, let me look at the large scale, here's the nation. I can, I can do, the nation as a whole is a large data set, the regions are not so large. Um, so I think, and so, but then the final question is, what does variability increase mean for anybody? Do you care if your house is hit by uh, a tornado, that it was hit by, there was one tornado this day in the country, or there was 50 tornadoes in this day? Does that matter? I'll tell you this, if you were hit by one that was 50, your cost of rebuilding is higher because materials are rare. But that's a pretty small difference. Uh, so what do we know, what do we know, does variability actually mean anything to anyone? It means a lot to people like insurance companies who are trying to maximize their return. Uh, but I'm not sure it means much to anybody else. So we may have, so that the, the fact that the biggest signal we see is an increase in variability, I'm not actually sure of the meaning of that in terms of the importance for anybody. And I think I'm gonna close with that and take whatever questions you have. All right, so uh, Dr. Brooks is now uh, available for questions, uh, well-intentioned pot shots like. or uh, <laughs> whatever else may come its way. Yeah, hey Bill. I was gonna ask you, um, looking at some of the graphs you were showing for like later on in the 21st century, mm -hmm. Would it be possible with the warming, saying the dip levels of the atmosphere, mm -hmm. that the conductive inhibition areas would be more intense and more wide? Right. Yeah. And I, and it, yeah, yes. The, 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 the question was if, if, we, if we warm the atmosphere above the ground, will that essentially stop storms from forming? Or will that have how big of an impact? That, that's, I think that's one of the big, one of the big questions, because we don't know how storm, from the environmental information, we really can't do the, the initiation very well. I think that's where the biggest thing about running things like the three and four kilometer models are, because they essentially can 
just like they do today, storms are starting. They can actually solve that hard problem for us. Uh, but that's so expensive to do, we haven't done very much of it. At the moment, it looks like the answer is, is that the, the frequency of a, the probability of having a storm, given good cape and good shear, will go down. But that, uh, and that's, in, that's in, and because of initiation, but that, the, uh, but that the increase in the number of favorable environments is larger than the, than the efficiency, you can think of it as going down is. So I think it's probably that our efficiency goes down, but we still have enough environments to be actually with more storms overall. A lot of times, when I was working convective weather, that was part of the biggest question. Yeah, yeah, it's still the, it's, it's the, it'll be, it'll be the biggest question. If you wouldn't have retired and you would have hung around for another 70 years, it would still be the biggest question you faced. Yeah, we essentially have to assume that the model, okay, the models are wrong. Okay. Well, yeah, well, we, well, let's, let's accept the fact that, I mean, what, what George Box is line about, you know, all models are wrong, some models are useful. That was, that was, that was one, of the great, one of the great statisticians of all time. Um, we assume that the models don't get wronger with initiation. And, and if that's true, then, what we've seen, well, if you looked at the Jensenian moat, if I showed you all the details of what they did with that, with those late 20th century stuff, the environment, the favor, the total favorable environments goes up a lot more. It goes up by, it more than doubles, but that the frequency of environments, once they run it through the, or f of, of, of events, once they run it through the, the, the three, the four kilometer model, goes up by 20%. So, yeah, and, and that's because there's less initiation relative to the environments. Others? Anybody? I have a layperson's question. Oh, shoot. I know, sorry. That's okay, that's okay. So, I know lay people. So, as, as we think about increasing severity and frequency of storms in the southeast, mm -hmm. how do we have those conversations about what may happen in the future? Sure. Okay. Well, I'll start with one thing. We don't have any evidence of, intens of, 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 of intensity getting, strong, of in getting worse if on, on thunderstorms. Um, that we, we don't really, and, and a lot of it has to do with the fact that it's so dependent on the wind shear term. Because the, the wind shear tells us how strong something, and we don't have any evidence of that, of that tail increasing. So that's a, 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 the, 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 the frequency goes up. So how do we have the conversations? Okay, that's, I'm not a policy person. That's item number one, and I will repeat that often enough. I'm not a policy person. Uh, headquarters has reminded me of that more than once. Uh, <laughs> uh, but but the, I, I think the, in, in large part, a lot of this in terms of, of, of preparation is um, these are the kinds of things that we should be doing anyway. Um, I mean, the, the city of Moore has, imp has improved its building code. Moore, Oklahoma, sorry, Moore, yeah, no. Uh, yeah, next, next door to me has, imp has, has improved their building code. And one of the things that's really interesting about that is that, um, okay, my house is completely, sur the, at least we have an in-residence shelter in my house in Norman. Um, I can almost see more from where I live. Uh, my house structurally is a whole lot better than my neighbor's house. Uh, my house might not make it through a strong tornado. My neighbor's house certainly won't. But what's going to take my house out is because her house is going to become debris and just go right through my house. So even if I had my house perfectly up to the new code, it probably wouldn't survive because of Kathy's house next to us. So my first, my first tornado plan is I go bulldoze Kathy's house down if the storms are coming. <laughs> Don't t please don't tell her that. Uh, but, oh, that was recorded too. So, okay, uh, but the... Uh, uh, but that you really need the whole community to be doing it. And one of the real problems in terms of doing this is that, um, okay, how many people have a fire extinguisher in their house? You know, various things? Okay, your insurance, your insurance company is supposed to give you a little break for that, right? Okay. The wind component of your house, of your house insurance is so small, it's, it's a few percent of your premium. Uh, it costs a thou It costs basically one percent when you build a new house to make it much more tornado-proof than it than it than it is. But it's actually not worth it for the insurance companies to give you much of a break, because they aren't 
charging very much for wind anyway because the, you, you pay your house, your, your homeowner's insurance goes for fire, hail, and for somebody falling on your front steps and suing you. Okay? The wind component is small. And that's one of our biggest things is in, in, in uh, you, when you go down to coastal Florida, the insurance company is going to play a huge role because there you're paying, a, you're paying a lot for hurricane insurance. And so they can give you a lot of money back if you do things to make sure they don't have to pay you a claim later. We don't have that in the tornado world or in the hail, really in the hail world either because hail resistant shingles don't actually do anything until you're at, at big hail. And so that's our one of our things is that we don't have a good way to make this happen. We have to have, have a, we have to have improved at community level. And it's gonna take 30 years for, or 40 years for Moore's housing stock to turn over. How old's the house you live in? You know, you aren't gonna go build a new house tomorrow because you think, man, I wanna make my house better resistant to tornado. You know, and that's, that's one of our other issues is the housing stock's always old. Yeah. But I think what we know mm. to a certain extent is when they do improve the code, mm. They do improve the survivability. Um, absolutely, absolutely. We, we have the knowledge. It's just not a, like I said, to me the real, the real I don't want to say crime, because that's probably a little too strong, is that, like I said, when we did the addition onto our house, the back end of my house will survive lots of things. The front end of the house is gone. Um, but that, you know, it, you know, we were doing roughly $80,000 on the addition and on the, on the, on the remodel and putting in the in-resident shelter. The extra stuff we put in was a thousand bucks. You know, over a 30 year mortgage, I don't even notice that that happened. Uh, if I would have retrofitted my house, that would have cost me order $10,000. That I notice if I'm doing that. So in all new construction, we ought to be doing that. You know, it, it just makes, it makes a lot of sense that it's such a small part. They learned, that, actually I've seen that in, in Oklahoma. There's a, one of our home builders, after the May 3rd, 1999 tornadoes, he did not make a business decision. He thought that morally, he should be building better houses for the people that he was selling to. He wasn't actually going to charge, he was going to eat the extra 1% because he thought he had a moral obligation to build better houses. He says, it, was the, it turns out it was the single best business decision he ever made in his entire life. His, house, his sales went up by 50% because people wanted his good houses. And he was going, man, you know, I wish I would have wish I would have started doing this a long time ago. Uh, and we found that people will pay a premium for those things um, because it provides peace of mind. I mean, I know when I'm out of town, my wife can get in the shelter. You know, the house may go, she's, she's alive. You know, and that, that, that's worth something. I want to ask one quick yeah. question, and then we'll, we'll call it a night. Mm -hmm. we'll, mm -hmm. we'll stick around for another question. Mm -hmm. yeah. This, of course, is about severe weather, not about, as you were talking about, that uh, precipitation so much. Right. Mm -hmm. But can you give sort of a, a, a layman's summary without too many polygraphic sure. words about uh, what we think may be happening with that over the long term, based upon what you've seen in the So I should say rain instead of precipitation, right? Yeah, 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 yeah rain. Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about rain. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, okay. The, one of the things that happen as the, as, the, as the planet warms is essentially the, the water cycle increases in intensity. Uh, you warm things up, evaporation increases. Rain increases because we're, we're, we're starting to have more things. What, what they found is that over, and this is particularly true of the north and the northeast, the United States, it's, it's still true in the south central but not as much, is that if you, even though the, the probability of rain has changed very little overall. The fraction of the rain that falls in the heaviest rain events has gone up dramatically, especially in the northeastern United States. Uh, and so that we're seeing a slight increase in rainfall, but it's concentrated on heaviest days. Uh, and so if you're, a, if you're a farmer, you know, you may have the same amount of rain, but if, it, if most of it falls on on a couple of days, that's actually not any good because it all runs off into 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 the into the in the Netherland, and so the the water management is going to be one of the really big issues as we go forward, uh, because how do you deal with, you know, some of the really huge flood events we've seen recently? I don't know what to do with, you know, when you get, you know, Norman went a couple of years ago in 2015, we had 20 something inches of rain in May. You know, it was bizarre driving around town because roads that, you know, we've got our four roads that always flood, but we had a bunch of other roads that flooded that never flood. 
And I think that's one of our real challenges. Is how to, and then we went into drought by the middle of summer. I think because this year here, mm -hmm. uh, you know, especially here in the month of July and August, yeah, we had some really great rain rain events here. And uh, that's a, that's a technical media term. Yeah. Right. Okay. <laughs> so, Oh, oh, yeah, yes, yes. Uh, but I think there's also uh, a human component. Mm -hmm. Oh, we, yes. Right. I mean, you know, if people, if, if you looked at what happened with uh, Harvey in Houston, you know, the, the interstate highways in Harvey, the interstate highways in Houston are designed to be the drainage. That's the drainage plan, is water down the interstate highways. You're supposed to see. 15 feet of water down Interstate 10. That's the plan, because there's no other place to put the water. I mean, that's what the city, that's, and it's not a horrible plan. You know, because it's, you know, if it's on the highway, you're at least not drowning people in their houses. But it really makes getting around a pain. Uh, and so, yeah, our land use stuff, I mean, that's what we see, I mean, again, back in Norman, uh, the one spot that always floods, Lindsay and McGee, uh, is in large part because they built this stupid strip mall with, you know, a, a 10 acres of has, asphalt on, uh, on a, on a uh, low-grade drainage area. So it all goes into that intersection because that's the lowest spot. And and yeah. I've got this soil model mm -hmm, that I've mm -hmm. and I can do it for the whole country mm -hmm. or I can do it for a spot. Yeah. And of course, from time to time, I share with my Facebook friends, the Kansas City mm -hmm. thing for the previous week and the coming, put the forecast mm -hmm. week out on the end of it. Mm -hmm. And when I have to try to explain to them why I say that the soil moisture content of the soil under Kansas City is two inches below normal, when the guy on TV just told them that it's where that rain falls 11 inches above normal right. for the year, mm -hmm. it's because of those gushes. Yeah. Great. Yeah. These are gushes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, think, I think that's a real. A, a, a real thing is that, you know, is that, is that um, you know, I, I, people were amazed in, in Norman in, in, in 2015 when it was like, we went, from, we went from drought to 20 inches of rain in a month, and two months later it was back to, we've got water bans because, you know, because it hasn't rained for a month. And, you know, a lot of that 20 inches of rain, you know, ended up in the Gulf of Mexico right away. Yeah. Yeah. Dinner, certainly. Uh, but I would suggest to you, if you want to see more about some of the latest state of the science, the fourth, the yeah. fourth national climate assessment, mm -hmm. the executive summary has been released. Mm -hmm. There will be uh, additional reports coming along out of that that will give you regional uh, synopses about much of this information. And so be looking for that. You can find it on the website, on the, 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 the web at it's globalchange.gov. Yeah, globalchange.gov. Yeah, globalchange yeah. And uh, there, there are sections that will be coming along, particularly this, uh, later on, uh, about the impact of on human health. Mm -hmm which I think uh, people who do public health are beginning to understand these connections, and so you'll be very right. oh, And I'll say one thing about, when you, when you look at any of these assessment reports, the, the National Climate Assessment, the IPCC reports, they tend to be conservative in their assessments because they represent consensus. They represent what almost all of us can agree upon. They're not extreme statements. They actually tend, when they make errors, they tend to make errors that are Things are changing faster or more than what the assessments say, because that's the nature of the beast in what, when we do the consensus building exercises. If I write a new paper, that's not going to be in this assessment. In fact, the paper we had submitted you know, a month ago, well, it's not in for sure. And it may not make the next IPCC assessment, which is we're in the process of getting ready to start that. So those are, those are always conservative descriptors of, what's, of what we know as scientists. All right, thank you all for coming. Yep. Thank you.